Hi, it's vintage computer time again. We love vintage computers here on the EUV blog, and this time we have the classic Radio Shack slash Tandy TRS-80 or Trash-80 colour computer or affectionately known as the Coco. Now, this one uh, was originally released in 1980, and it was the follow-up to the original TRS-80 computer, but it is a completely different beast. This is the TRS-80 color computer as opposed to the previous TRS-80, which was not a color computer, hence why they had the fancy little red, green, and blue there. So it's actually a completely different design using a different processor, but they kept the name TRS-80, even though the 80 in the previous one pretty much stood for the fact that it used a Z80 processor. This one completely changed from Z80 to the Motorola 6809 processor, and like entirely different. But for some reason, eh, they wanted to keep the branding. Nah, eh, marketing. And it's got a classic uh, chiclet style keyboard here. The chiclet one means it's got square keys uh, with the spaces between them like that. And the feel is very uh, spongy. You really, yeah, this is not your friend, this keyboard. Now, the original 1980 model uh, started with an entry-level 4K model. It actually had a black surround on here, so this one uh, must be a later uh, unit than that. So, ultimately, was discontinued in 1983, or it was replaced by the Color Computer 2, and then the Color Computer 3, or Coco 2, or Coco 3. But this is effectively the original design from 1980 up until 1983, and it eventually shipped with uh, 64K of RAM. Now, this was originally released at 399 US dollars and that's 1980 US dollars and that was a pretty decent price uh, back in the day for a computer. You've got to remember like uh, computers like the Commodore 64 weren't around yet. They'd be another uh, couple of years or so. I mean not even the uh, VIC-20 was around then. The TI-994A wasn't around then. Didn't come out until 1981 uh, and so you know you had the likes of the Atari 800 as a competitor the original Apple II. One's like like that. So you've got to remember the market was still very primitive in 1980. Once we got on to 82, 83 with the Commodore 64 and other uh, more advanced computers then you know it got a bit more fancy pantsy but this was a state-of-the-art low-cost home computer in 1980. So on the side here it had the uh, flap for the uh, cartridges you could just uh, plug in of course your game cartridges and program cartridges on ROM. And on the back, nothing fancy. We've got a power switch, uh, left and right joystick. It was mains directly in, none of this uh, IEC rubbish. Uh, dual joysticks for you know, two players at once. Wow, fancy. Um, serial I.O. port, which could uh, bugger off to, uh, like, later on, they probably had a modem attachment or whatever. And cassette drive, fantastic. Uh, channel select for the uh, video. And that looks like a composite output, but it's not. It's a direct RF modulated output directly to your TV. So that's really rather annoying, but hey, they were designing it for the home computer. So it couldn't go to a computer monitor, it had to go to an RF television. And a reset button. Don't accidentally press that, lose your entire program. And on the back here, uh, just some uh, vents there, and no, this thing didn't have a fan at all. And there's the label for those playing along at home. Tandy Corporation, none of this Radio Shack rubbish. This is actually an Australian version, hence the uh, PAL format here, 220, 240 volts AC. So different markets had to have a uh, particular uh, transformer wired in them. It takes about 24 watts or thereabouts. Made in Korea, thank you very much. Bob's your uncle. And serial number, 503045, is it, for those playing along at home? And this bad boy ran at a whopping 895 kilohertz or double that depending on how it was operating and stuff like that. So not particularly quick, but hey, that was what it was back in 1980. Check it out. We have the operation manual for this thing. Look at this. <laughs> Let's have a look to our customers. It's not very big, so I can show you the whole blinking lot, really. Welcome to the TRS-80 Color. Yeah. Oh, look at this. It's, oh, extolling the virtues of this bad boy. Really fantastic. And installation, connecting to your television set. Antenna, hook it up. They've got all the fancy pantsy pictures. Just showing you what it is, how to hook up the cassette recorder, stuff like that, how to power it on, the reset switch, and it had 
nine colors. Wow. Using the keyboard, using the joystick, using the cassette recorder to save and load programs. And that was pretty much it. A couple of little uh, demo programs or whatever, but that was, that was it. Oh, jeez. Not much of a manual, is it? But this is where it all happened, getting started with Color Basic. Fantastic, and oh, look at all this. Look at all this. Ah, oh, all these programs, which they didn't actually tell you in there. You had to, like, go to the end to get the programs. They kind of, like, you know, tried to make you do it yourself and all that sort of jazz. But, you know, a lot of work went into that. And once you had perfected that, you went... Extended Color Basic, thank you very much for the larger memory ones. I believe Extended Color Basic was not available for the uh, lesser memory uh, model units back in the day. But oh, look, at the, look at the graphics. Look at the graphics. Oh, the pages are stuck together. Oh, somebody got so excited that <laughs> the pages are stuck. No comment. All right, let's have a look inside this bad boy, as is very common with this uh, design back in the day. Oh, we're in like Flynn. Look at this. Classic 1980, like early 80s uh, construction here. You can't half tell with the, um, well, all through hole uh, construction, the large ceramic caps down here for the uh, bypassing on the memory and everything else. They just don't make them like that anymore really um and that's pretty how you're doing we've just got the uh cardboard over the top of the transformer here to uh insulate that we've got our power supply stuff up here it looks like we've got our main regulator our rf modulator up the back uh there's our processor we'll take a closer look if we got our roms there we've got our memory and the pio and the video display controller and whatnot there's not much in these things actually the keyboard, there we go, the keyboard just uh, pops off so you can see the entire board populated there. And uh, just a double-sided layout, nothing fancy, and it's just very typical of what you'd expect in a like late 70s, early 80s vintage computer. There's no custom ASICs, uh, gate arrays, or anything like that. Just uses the off-the-shelf uh, Motorola stuff, uh, plus uh, just, you know, generic 7400 series logic. Now the computer might have been made in uh, South Korea, but the keyboard, made in Japan. All the best stuff's made in Japan. Now this definitely looks like a uh, later model, because look, we've got uh, jumper switches here, 16K and 64K. If you can see that, and over here as well, 16K, 64, <laughs> looks like we've got the 64K populated one. Oh, just feel the power. And sure enough, they are HM6842P uh, uh, DRAMs, and these are 64K bit ones. So, of course, we've got two, four, six, eight. None of that parody rubbish. I find it interesting that they've got the ferrite beads in here. They were taking uh, EMI into consideration, electromagnetic uh, uh, interference. They were just trying to uh, take the edge off all that... Uh, Nasty 5 volts TTL running around on that uh, double-sided PCB without the ground plane. There's the brains of the outfit, the Motorola MC6809, and this was a state-of-the-art processor back in the day. And above that we have our ROMs. I don't know why we've got Rev 1.0 and Rev 1.1. I'm not sure what the deal is there. I'm... Bueller? Bueller? And above that is a curious beast. It's actually a 74LS783, a.k.a. a Motorola um, MC6883. And this is what's called a synchronous address multiplexer. And if we move over from there, we have uh, two other major large LSI chips. So this one here is the MC6822, and this is the MC6821. And you probably can't half tell what the uh, 6822 is doing, 
by the traces going up here to the ribbon cable, it's going up to the keyboard, and um, this one's actually what's called an industrial uh, interface adapter. It's got like open drain outputs and other stuff for more industrial, in quote marks, um, type interfacing, whereas your uh, 6821 is your regular uh, PIA, your peripheral interface adapter, as opposed to an industrial interface adapter. This one just uh, uh, allows you to interface with more uh, generic logic as opposed to like having open drain outputs which are pretty useful for uh, keyboards and stuff like that. And from there if we head down we've got ourselves the video controller the MC6847P. You can see the main crystal there the uh, 4.43 uh, double three. 618 designates this one as a uh, PAL unit as opposed to uh, NTSC which would uh, likely have a different frequency crystal in there for the color subcarrier frequency so that's a, a dead giveaway that this is the video chip you wouldn't even have to uh, you know look that one up you know just by the freak uh, just by the uh, crystal next to it that's what it's doing and right next to that, there is our uh, video generator. It's an RF video generator chip, but we're not actually uh, modulating with the RF. The RF is actually disabled in this uh, chip. They use a diode and whatnot to uh, actually disable the RF uh, oscillator because they've got their own RF uh, unit here. So this one is just working as a uh, video mixer, basically. That's the Motorola MC1372. As you can see, it's basically Motorola everything inside this. I mean, even the uh, even your generic uh, Jelly Bean 74LS logic seems to be Motorola. So <laughs> huge design win. They just bought them in bulk. Yep, yep. Motorola as far as the eye can see. I think the only thing that's not Motorola, of course, is the memory up there. But, uh, geez, there, oh, no, no, NEC ROMs. Oh, sorry. But I believe on oh, practically every other chip inside this puppy is. And the mains here is pretty how you're doing. Just got this cardboard uh, insulated flap. It's like, you know, it was par for the course back in the day. You know, you just don't find that sort of stuff uh, these days. And, uh, of course, all your isolation is done on there. And then it comes off and you just got your regular linear regulators. None of this switch mode rubbish. And, of course, your main 5-volt uh, regulator up here. And this one actually doesn't uh, switch the mains on the PCB. The mains just go straight into the transformer. So that's permanently uh, hooked on. And the power switch actually just switches the uh, secondary here. Now, if we have a look at some of the date codes here, 14th week, 83, 16th week, 83, 83, 83. So it looks like, guess what? We've got a 1983 vintage machine, mid uh, you know, early to mid uh, 83 vintage. So it's definitely one of the later units because this thing was almost discontinued by then. Now, if you have a look at the overall design here, it, it's basically uh, straight out of the Motorola uh, application note slash uh, data sheet, uh, basic block diagram of a computer. They just used the Motorola chipsets and they basically just slapped the thing together. There it was straight out of the application note. The design was practically already done for them. The 6809 uh, CPU slash MPU, uh, the synchronous address multiplexer there, the VDG, the video uh, display generator, the 6847, and the, the MC1372, and they just whack on DRAM, and that's it. The rest is just uh, the uh, the ROM, basically. So it was just like an off-the-shelf design computer straight from Motorola. So, you know, Tandy just went, hey, thank you very much, we'll take that. So I want to power this thing up and try it, but I don't have like a TV with an RF uh, input here in the lab anymore. So, and that's the only output we've got, the RF output here. So I thought that we'd uh, uh, build up a little circuit to try and uh, tap off the composite video output, because this thing's got to have composite video to feed into the RF tuner here in order to then modulate the RF and uh, be received as a normal TV. So it's certainly got the capability to do that. And sure enough, if you check online, there's various mods and uh, things for adding a composite video output to the uh, Coco here, but they don't seem to match up with what, well, the particular board I've got here. 
So the classic mod circuit uh, says to tap off pin 12 of U12 or for the new board, whatever that means, uh, U6, presumably still pin 12 of U6, but have a look at the chips. So it obviously can't be U12 there because that's just a uh, 74LS, uh, what is it, 273. And U6 is a 74LS02. Once again, both digital chips. Not that. Aha, uh -huh, that looks like it there. The MC1372. That's U5 on this particular board. And there's the money shot inside the tuner for you tuner fanboys. I know you're out there. So if we actually have a look at pin 12, which is the R, which is normally the RF output of that uh, 1372, look at that, Bob's your uncle. And there you go, whoop, there you go, we caught it. There is a classic, oh, we got some change in uh, video information in there, captured that, that is your classic composite video signal. So this puppy... Is work, it looks like it's working just fine. So that is pin 12, and also you can probably see there's just some, uh, there's just a couple of little bodge wires over there going into the side of the uh, RF tuner there, and that also has the composite signal on there, but it looks like it's maybe slightly attenuated. Yeah, seems to be attenuated actually going into the tuner. So. I don't know what the difference is there. We should be able to tap off either of those, though, I suspect. Pin 12 of the chip, we're at uh, 200 millivolts uh, per division. So that's, you know, 200, 400, 600, 800. That's like your traditional level for the uh, composite video, whereas the one that's going into the modulator is, yeah, I don't think that's that great. So why it's attenuated like that, I'm not sure. It's a requirement of the... Uh, uh, the tuner module there, but anyway, so let's try and tap off uh, pin 12 and see what happens. Now in theory I don't think we actually need that uh, transistor Darlington arrangement configuration to actually drive this. We've got our composite signal because all that is is a uh, common emitter follower that just drives the uh, you know that drives the coax and doesn't affect the signal, like it won't uh, uh, kill the RF output from here, you could use both at the same time, for example, but I've just hacked in a cap in here because this does have a, uh, both of them have a very significant uh, DC offset, which you don't want, so I'm just AC coupling that into, uh, straight into the coax with nothing and into a little HDMI, um, you know, one of these little cheap eBay jobs and ta-da! Look at that, we've got something. It's not quite there, but you can see that it works. Extended color, basic, copyright, under license. Okay, and hello, world. So it really doesn't like that at all. And well, I'm not sure whether or not it's because of the buffer or not. I'd have to build up the uh, uh, Darlington transistor buffer and uh, try it. But hey, it, it's driving that coax and no problems. Well, at least we're getting something. You know, like, I'm not sure whether or not this, I haven't tried this uh, decoder box yet. It's just one of these eBay uh, cheapies, so i got no idea. But at least it's doing something. We can see that the computer still works. Awesome. Check this out. If I actually uh, reset the computer, wait a second, there we go. It almost came like it was perfect, and then it just shifts off to the side, so it could very well be something wrong with that little uh, uh, composite to HDMI box. And I powered it up and uh, pressed reset again. I was able to actually get a uh, constant screen like this, but it's almost unreadable, unfortunately. Okay, what I've hooked up now is a little uh, dual transistor 2N222s uh, in a Darlington configuration, just an emitter uh, follower. Got them powered from uh, 5 volts over here. Tapping directly off uh, the pin 12 uh, output, video output of the 1327 there, and uh, through a 22 ohm. Let's give it a go, shall we? Here we go. Going to power it on. And... Hello! Oh. oh! It's got to be that stupid HDMI converter thing. Alright, I'm using one of these uh, car rear vision uh, display type things, and there we go. That's not too shabby, but the colours are just horrible on this. They really are. Ugh. Anyway, we're back on the full monitor there. I dicked around with the monitor a bit, and if I press that reset button, I can actually get it 
to be stable. As long as I, you know, stand on one leg, hold my tongue at the right angle and cross my fingers. Uh, let's stick with that. That's all right. That's probably the best we're going to get. So can anyone actually tell us, did it really look this bad back in the day or is that just a modern, uh, you know, issue with uh, monitors and stuff like that? Because, you know, it's just horribly distorted, but yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> look at the flashing cursor. That's just horrible. Check it out. If we don't like that, we can change the background colour. I don't know why it, uh, it comes up with still the green one at the top. That's a bit ridiculous. What if we, no, if we hit reset, it's just going to, uh, yeah, it's just going to go back to the green, but uh, yeah, we can change it to any colour we like. Well, almost, but <laughs> unbelievable. And of course, it's all uppercase, but apparently, obviously, we can press shift zero to go into a lowercase mode, and that's supposed to indicate uppercase and lowercase. <laughs> ah, the 1980s classic. <laughs> what use is that, really? All right, it's time to see what this bad boy can do. I put in a badass program. Look at this. We're going to check out the uh, color and the graphics capability of this thing. Let's go. All eight colors or whatever it's got. Oh, look at the stunning graphics. Yes, that's the pixel resolution. That's as good as it gets. Ah, oh, but that was state of the art in 1980, wasn't it? Hmm. And look at that paint drawing speed at the whopping, what is it, 892 kilohertz clock rate. Fantastic. So there you have it. That's the Tandy slash Radio Shack TRS-80 color computer, or affectionately known as the Coco. And it was followed up by the color computer 2 and the color computer 3 before it was eventually uh, discontinued. So there you go. I hope you found that interesting. I'll link in about here at the end of the video, the original TRS-80 uh, color computer, one of the world's first home computers in uh, 1977, I believe it was. So I've done a uh, tear down and look at a working version of one of those. So check it out. So let us know if you had one of these things. How long did you use it for? What model did you have? Did you upgrade to the Color Computer 2, the Coco 3? Ah, uh, classic stuff. Those were the days. If you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps a lot. And as always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.